name's Bond. James Bond. Hello and welcome. You're listening to Bond vs. Godzilla, the podcast that compares and contrasts two of the longest-running film series in cinema history. My name is Cruz Moore, and I will be your resident Godzilla expert on this show. Joining me on this cinematic journey for however long it lasts are three of my very good friends who each have their own history and experience with both film franchises. Bond expert Jacob Roberts. Hi, I'm Jacob Roberts, current asking price, $1 million. Audio engineer Willie Crook. The light's not that red. And digital artist Chas Lemons. Hi, I'm trying... <laughs> damn it! God damn! <laughs> it's your own name! <laughs> Is it Charles or Chas, though? I do not know this! On today's episode, we'll be tackling The Man with the Golden Gun from 1974 and Godzilla's Revenge from 1969. So without further ado, Jake, give us a backstory on Christopher Lee's third nipple. The Man with the Golden Gun is based off of Ian Fleming's 12th and final James Bond novel, which was published a year after his death in 1965. 1973 saw the world gripped by an energy crisis, during which the price of oil quadrupled and interest in alternative energy sources increased. Therefore, Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman decided to scrap Fleming's original plot to dispatch a KGB assassin in favor of a more modern dilemma for moviegoers to identify with. Just like with Live and Let Die, director Guy Hamilton, brought back for his third film in a row, decided to capitalize on another cinematic phenomenon that had taken over the silver screen, in this case, the ever-popular Hong Kong martial arts film. Bruce Lee was a worldwide superstar, and Western interest in Eastern fighting styles was at an all-time high. It only made sense that James Bond's next adventure would have him travel to Hong Kong to solve the energy crisis. There would be no other time in history in which such a bizarre combination of ideas could give birth to what is nowadays seen as one of 007's most nonsensical outings. The Man with a Golden Gun would be the last Bond film that original producers Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman would make together. The two of them managed to make James Bond the most successful franchise in cinema history at the time. Unfortunately, this titanic partnership had to come to an end due to Saltzman's compounding debts. In order to pay off his debts, Saltzman sold his half of the rights to the franchise to United Artists, thus ensuring that Cubby Broccoli would be the sole executive producer of the franchise for the near future. Yeah, as the films continue, it kind of, these are starting to feel less like they're reaching the heights of the previous ones, and these are more kind of like adventure of the week. Still entertaining, but not they're not reaching the the levels that we've had before. That's that's going to be the pattern of the entire Roger Moore era. Mm-hmm. The entire Roger Moore sequence of films very much are kind of an adventure of the week thing, and. In some senses, I kind of see it as a weakness of the Roger Moore era. Um, I feel like this era of James Bond is where they the the Bond formula, as you know it, really comes into play. That that's that's more of a problem with the entire era as a whole. Looking individually, like you know, you look at Live and Let Die, and you look at the Man with the Golden Gun on their own, and they are just you know fun. Saturday morning cartoon adventures that just exist within their own world. Hmm. And that's why I think even though they're staying in their own comfort zone, they're still experimenting with a lot of weird ideas, which starts off with Christopher Lee's skeleton funhouse for some reason, and then knickknack, and then going to Hong Kong, and then what what other weird things are in this movie? I remember one time I was um I was at my home, I was I was watching The Man with the Golden Gun. Uh, my nephew was in the other room just playing video games, um, and he, he he knew I was I was watching the movie. I even invited him, like, "Hey, you want to watch it with uh, watch it with me?" He's like, "No, that's okay. Okay, no, it's fine. Go uh, whatever." Uh, he walks in during uh, grab a snack or whatever during the scene at the uh, at the martial arts school, and uh, he just uh, you know rather curiously says, um, uh, "What what what's going on now?" Bond got sent to school. <laughs> yeah, he asks why because he lost a fight to a sumo wrestler. 
<laughs> I don't know. It's just it's sentences like that that I feel just make this series so beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I was really expecting Chaz to, to pull one of his usual things that like, just kill him already! When when when, when Nick Knack was about to take the pitchfork into Bond mm-hmm. and the guy and, and the guy stops him and says, not here. <laughs> hey, this I've is got, my home. I've take got, him to school. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've gotten used to Roger Moore enough at this point. Mm-hmm. Jake, during that story, I was You've assuming... seen one movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Much. It's kind of enough. <laughs> <laughs> you surprised how quickly it can take, Jake. Uh, during that yeah. story, I assumed uh, that uh, he 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 got more interest uh, in the movie uh, when he walked in on the scene of James Bond just suddenly walks in front of this woman st- skinny dipping. He did right. go back to uh, playing his his video games, but I did try to entice him back in. Like, oh, wait, 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 hang around long enough, you'll see, get to see Bond fight a midget. So, <laughs> <laughs> for some reason, that didn't seem to entice him. I don't understand. He's, he's just a lost cause. It's okay. <laughs> Well, I guess I guess I was gonna save this for later, but since Chaz brought up the the skinny dipping scene, is this the only Bond film that has Vag? Uh, mm-hmm. Am I the only one that noticed that? I mean, it's definitely within the confines that you know the water was you know murky <laughs> enough that they were able to get away with it. There's but other they sh- didn't. It was pretty damn clear. <laughs> it was, there's there's shots throughout the films that you know they they try to cover the girl with uh you know fog glass or you mm-hmm. know what have you uh and how that normally succe- works how successful that is uh your mileage mm-hmm. may vary <laughs> i mean i feel like i feel like that you could like this movie is pg and <laughs> yeah. there's just a straight up shot of vag in like, it oh yeah no and uh in maurice bender's um opening title sequences especially you know no side on silhouette shots you can mm-hmm. you can see things mm-hmm. yeah but at least that's like promiscuous and eludes something to the imagination whereas this is like i'm just staring at a pool <laughs> where where this is uh the uh, the point where teenagers would uh freeze the or try to pause the movie or fast forward to i'm like you you say that but <laughs> i 100 percent blame the beirut sequence for my uh for my abdomen fetish so there's that oh <laughs> <laughs> that that scene had a <laughs> profound effect on me as a child ladies and gentlemen we're all learning new things about jake oh, this yes. episode <laughs> I mean, it's hard. It's it's hard to ask anything, but I mean, who wouldn't? I I, I, I wouldn't. I mean, <laughs> that kind of gets destroyed by the concept of like I'm just gonna bite this off of you, this piece of metal, and then swallow it. It's like ew. Well, he didn't want to swallow it. <laughs> like, how many times was that washed and sanitized? The the, the bullet. I mean, it came out ew. of the gun pretty hot. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> then again, it was though it was in her belly button. I Which keep this dangerous piece of metal on me at all times. It's a good luck charm. <laughs> well, it's not its not dangerous anymore. It's a used bullet. Uh, you know, Jake, something I noticed that was interesting um, about the uh, the, pro- the gun prop was like, yeah. part of it was like, man, I was like, it's really blocky, but it was like, oh, okay, it's actually... It's made of things, yeah. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. actually made out of a, lo- a cigarette case, a yeah, lighter. A lighter, and a pen. Yeah, and the barrel's a pen, so I was like... And it triggers a cufflink, yeah. They actually had uh, three different versions of the prop that was used used for filming uh one that's just like a, a solid piece uh one that's uh for assembling and disassembling it and then one that is capable of firing uh, a blank for when the gun is actually fired uh, i know one of the props um that was used um in the filming went missing from like um from like like, like the prop warehouse it went missing no one someone stole it <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like the story tells about the the uh, godzilla suit yeah exactly like it got <laughs> stolen no one knows where it went it, it's mm-hmm. just sitting in someone's private collection that yeah, basically someone inherited and it's just like they don't even know it's there if yeah you find the man with the golden gun fire him <laughs> <laughs> fire the damn thief because he stole a gun that christopher lee just casually puts together in front of his business partner and he just doesn't Think of hmm. Just dis- disassembling my lighter pen and uh, cigarette holder combo. It's funny because I I believe I've read somewhere. I'm not sure if I can verify this, but I believe I read somewhere that um, uh, when Christopher Lee was coming over to uh, America to promote the film, he brought um, uh, the Golden Gun prop with him, and it was actually uh, uh, confiscated by U.S. Customs. No, you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I can't understand why. No surprise. <laughs> Yeah, something I actually noticed he in the credits. He, he should have brought it in the three pieces. That way they were oh, none, yep. none, none the wiser. They could have assembled it. Or was it the single or blank firing prop? 
I mean, I imagine it was probably just like the solid one. Probably. I, yeah, I also noticed during the credits that uh, the per, the company that made it was actually individually credited. It was a Colibri, mm-hmm. which I believe is also the company that makes the world's smallest gun. So, Jake, can yeah. you please tell me what culture specifically regarding third nipple with sexual prowess and invulnerability? <laughs> Uh, considering the line came from high fat, I guess it's some kind of ancient Thai culture. I don't know. Was that in the book or like where, where did he get the I, idea for the script? I know Scaramanga does have a third nipple in the book. I don't know if the invulnerability and sexual prowess line is in the book. I do know that the third nipple does come from the book. You know, we were talking about in a previous episode how, you know, when we're a kid, we'll, we'll see a reference um, yeah. in media of something we know. I always go back to um, uh, an episode of Ed, Ed, Nettie, <laughs> where um, they're having uh, they're having this pool party. The Eds uh, lose their swimming trunks, and so to hide their nakedness, they spend the entire party in the uh, in the kiddie pool. Like mm-hmm. you know, remember when someone tries to get close to the kiddie pool, they would always try to scare them away. <laughs> so here comes like Naz walking up to the to the pool, yeah. and Eddie gives the line uh, uh, to scare her away. He says. Ed has a third nipple like that bad guy in James Bond. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Well, since, since we're on the, the subject of him, what uh, what are your guys' thoughts on Scaramanga, our villain of the, of the week? Well, they definitely build him up. But I don't, besides being portrayed by Christopher Lee, I don't feel like he has much going for him other than his, his fetishizing his gun so much. Mm-hmm. And then... <laughs> I mean, much uh, he doesn't do it as well as other Bond villains, but he has like a fanboy appeal to Bond himself, and he just ends up getting shot. Nothing big or crazy, just yeah. shot. Yeah, nothing special. Because like, he's hanging out in his stupid fun house. I still don't know why that exists. Is there, is it for him to train himself? And How are you? Because j- Nick Knack would always hire assassins that come to try and take out Scaramanga, and he uses those assassins to uh, keep his skills up inside a... The fun house. Did he hire Walt Disney to do it for him? Like, why is there a cowboy sequence? Why is there Al Capone? Like, I don't understand. Scaramanga was has always been one of my favorite uh, villains in the series. Uh, there's been many villains in the franchise that have kind of tried to play the angle of the dark version of James Bond. You know, like mm-hmm. this is who James Bond would be mm-hmm. if he was evil. There's been many villains that have gone at that angle. I feel like Scaramanga is the one that has done it the best. I feel um, he is the villain that I've always kind of considered the most to be Bond's equal. Hmm. At least that, that's kind of how I felt it, you know, growing up that, you know, Scaramanga was might have partially might have been influenced by uh, by the golden gun weapon in uh, in Golden Eye and other James Bond video games and how powerful it is. So I may have like associated that power with the character. But I've always felt that, you know, Scaramanga was maybe one of the most deadly of the James Bond main villains, especially since he's not a villain who just sits on his chair in the final boss room commanding his his minions. He really doesn't have minions aside from Knickknack. He's just <laughs> one really powerful, deadly assassin just going out there killing people. And that that's always kind of appealed to me. So I've I've always really liked Scaramanga. Was he MI6 or was he a part of a different agency? Uh, they say in the movie that he was uh, uh, trained by the KGB until he went solo. Okay, because when you said that he, he's almost like the the negative version of James Bond, it reminded me a lot of the villain in Skyfall. Yeah. And how it's one more secret agent that's fallen from grace and has now taken on his own power. Yes, it's a very similar thing. Uh, like I said, there's been several villains that have gone for that dark James Bond uh, angle. Uh, Silva from Skyfall is another one of those. Hmm. I think that's, I think that's part of why I'm just so annoyed by it because it's like, okay, you clearly have, you've made a good pretty life for yourself on this island. I mean, you have this giant investment with solar power and it's like, well, at a million dollars or whatever, things are going pretty well. And then you just get shot in your fun house. One thing like, um, you let this guy come to your island and then you just got yourself killed. Well, he wanted to play with him a bit. <sighs> Destroy think, his plane. <laughs> I think I think that is something that um, because among amongst the fandom, this film kind of gets um, gets a bad rap. It's it's often considered to be like one of the worst films. I sort of come to its defense quite often. Uh, I personally think this film is just really fun for its wackiness. I admit it does have some problems 
one of the things that the film, you know, really tried to advertise and tout it as, you know, this duel between James Bond versus the greatest assassin in the world um, doesn't play the biggest role. Like, that's not like the centerpiece of the film. So I can I can see where people come from when they say, like, you know, the final duel and the final confrontation between the two is slightly underwhelming. I personally, you know, always watching it as a kid, to me, it was just the hypest thing in the universe just to have, you know, Bond scouring this island. Scaramanga could be around any corner going through that fun house. It was, I, I think I, I vaguely remember watching it for the first time, having it just feel super tense. Uh, because it's not, it's really, really not often in uh James Bond movie where you essentially have a cat and mouse uh, sequence. Why is there a spooky, scary skeleton in this maze? I don't know. <laughs> and for that matter, like, so, so like, what's the deal with Knickknack? Is he in the book or what was the idea behind that? I don't, I don't think Knickknack's in the book. Uh, I, th- I think he was uh, created for the movie. Yeah, the aside from Scaramanga himself, the Golden Gun, and the Third Nipple, I think that's like really the only things that actually carried over from the book. Hmm. Uh, as far as Knickknack is concerned, I didn't run across um, any evidence or anything that talked about you know his inspiration or the reason behind his creation. It could have just be simple as they thought it would be an interesting direction to take. This era of Bond in particular um, is really where they went uh, went in heavy on the fun oddball henchmen. Mm. Uh, you know, take, taking that kind of idea originally inspired by Odd Job and just taking it to the next level every movie. So, you know, we've had the Mr. Wynn to Mr. Kid. We had uh, Tee Hee and Baron Samity. Yeah. Now we have Nick Knack and we're going to have more of them going forward. So this is the era of you know, the weird and wacky memorable henchmen, which I honestly miss in mm-hmm. the recent <laughs> Bond films. I, I want those kind of guys to come back. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, uh, just talking about the, uh, the end fight scene. It was, uh, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty funny how there was a, there was a Chekhov's bond basically right there. And uh, honestly, if I was Scaramanga, that, that would be something I would have checked real quick just to make sure. It- <laughs> yeah. He seemed for some reason has like a life size replica of him just kind of standing there. Did, yeah, did Nick Knack make that? I just, there's so many questions that don't Nick-Nack. make yeah. sense. Madam Tussauds it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Cruz, it was, uh, it, was for, it was for affectionate reasons. So wait, if he's standing in the same spot that the figure was in, did, did Bond move the figure? He just quietly move the, the figure. That's the part you're not supposed to think about uh, too hard. Because <laughs> uh, the, the movie wants you to believe that uh, Scaramanga did not notice Bond moving the mannequin out of the way, changing into the mannequin's clothes, mm. getting into the mannequin's position with the with the gun that, you know, is that the same gun that Bond dropped earlier or is it a new one? Who knows? <laughs> Shit, yeah, I just realized that they, Bond was wearing different clothes right yeah, then. he changed into the mannequin's clothes. <laughs> so there's just a naked <laughs> Bond mannequin lying somewhere off shot. No one can see my frustration right now. Don't worry, Scaramanga not that it matters. is not the, the greatest assassin in the world. He can, uh, nothing can ever get over Scaramanga. But mm-hmm. he is not a wax figure connoisseur. We did have fun with the idea of like, well, no one knows what Scaramanga looks like. So every single time Bond runs into someone, we're like, are you Scaramanga? <laughs> are, <laughs> yeah. you Scaramanga? <laughs> are you Money Penny? are you Scaramanga? <laughs> Be are honest you? with me now. Are you Squidward? <laughs> <laughs> For the last time now. <laughs> Now are you Scaramanga? <laughs> <laughs> Scaramanga now. We also had a lot of fun. Just like the, f- we just pretty much started quoting any role that Christopher Lee has had. So whether it's like Dracula or um, the evil guy from Lord of the Rings, I still can't remember his name. So you're gonna say the evil guy from Star Wars? Yeah, you have Count Dooku the whole time. So we were just pretty much making Star Wars jokes the whole time. <laughs> To the point where Bond was like, oh, I could think of a four-lettered word to use for you. And Chaz, you're just like, Sith? <laughs> <laughs> and then Bond goes into like a Empire Strikes Back dream sequence where he must face himself. What's the quote from that again? Oh, yeah. Where, uh, where Luke asks like, well, what's in there? And Yoda's mm-hmm. just like, only what you bring with you. <laughs> so Bond just like, Cuts Darth Vader's face open, and inside it's just Sean Connery's face. (laughs) (laughs) 
Wait, wait. Well, what scene was he threatening to break someone's arm again? Uh, that's when uh, he was in the hotel when he uh, tracked the bullets to uh, uh, Scaramanga's mistress. And uh, he had to threaten her to try to find out where Scaramanga yeah. was going to be that night. And he threatened to break her arm. Roger Moore was actually very much against that. The, the scene really? of him th- <laughs> him threatening to uh, to break uh, Anders' arm. Yeah, it's a little extreme. Yeah, no, I mean, maybe not for the character, but still just like, whoa, dude. That's... that's um, that's uh, that's one of the remnants that I was talking about of them still kind of writing for Sean. Uh, that, that's much more of like a Sean thing to do. Roger was very much against it. He hated the idea. Um, he also really disliked the the scene of him shoving a, a, a poor little boy into the river. <laughs> I was making jokes about that the whole time, and then eventually he did it. I'm like, oh, all right, cool. He, he, he very much hated that because, you know, as a, <laughs> as a UNICEF ambassador oh, okay. and, oh, wow. and humanity, yeah, he... Roger Moore was big on on UNICEF. That was, that was like his grand thing in his life, even above Bond, was being a UNICEF ambassador. So he was really uncomfortable with shoving this poor Thai boy into the <laughs> river. Uh, so <laughs> if this movie were made today, he would get canceled so fucking oh, fast. So, <laughs> so as as ditzy as she kind of was, and the fact we we feel like we're supposed to know who she is, but this is the first time we're being introduced to her. I kind of like Bond having this. Uh, like female sidekick that actually can accomplish stuff without uh-huh. really intending to, because it kind of like keeps his ego in check. Mm, so, so do, do you say do you uh, did did you like the character of Mary Goodnight? Yeah, I think so. Really, I think by the end of it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I, I liked her character like when it came down to like uh, <laughs> how like. Because by the end of it, her job is to just just push every button, and she's like, okay, cool. So it's really interesting to me that um, that that you say that because for me personally. Um, Good night probably stands as one of my least favorite Bond girls. Hmm. Um, to me, she always just came across as too ditzy. Like I always kind of use her as the prime example of the ditzy, useless Bond girl whose only job is to get captured and get saved by James, um, getting herself locked inside the uh, in the trunk of the villain's car, and then quite proudly proclaiming that yeah. she has the car keys and the Solex. I like that, though. <laughs> and the fact, I mean, it, we're like we're in a universe where it's, if you open the trunk of a car while you're flying, you don't immediately get sucked out. But it's like the fact that she's going through all these things, like she's kind of like the Chris Tucker to Jackie Chan in this movie. Does she come back? No. No, come on. <laughs> the, the, no Bond girls ever come For back fuck's in, the, sake. in the classic movies. Oh, really? I know, but, but this isn't even like, uh, I mean, she's a Bond girl, but she's more of like part of his actual team to mm-hmm. help him out. Yeah, she's, she, she's a recurring character yeah. in the books, um, hmm. so fi- eventually serving as the main Bond girl in the final book. But she She's kind of like the money punny that gets to do stuff on the mission. That's essentially yeah. what she is in the book. She, she's mm-hmm. kind of in the book, she's Bond's personal secretary, so she's like his personal money penny. I mean, this, this movie has a bunch of like fun little goofs in it. Um, you know, I tried to to put your guys' direction to it in the yeah, yeah, yeah. root fight scene. Did you guys see what was in the mirror? Yeah, the whole crew. The whole that. crew. And I actually, oh, really? I love. Yeah, no, in the in, in the fight scene mm. uh, after you know when Bond swallows the the golden bullet and he's wrestling those guys in the in the dressing room. There's one point where they accidentally bump into the vanity mirror and the mirror turns and you can just see the <laughs> film crew just in the mirror, camera and mics and everything just standing there. Oh, wow. Um, in some releases of the film uh, that uh, that is uh, edited to where they just white out uh, the mirror so you can't see the film crew. But uh, gotta, this, is, this is one of the release versions that you can just see the crew right there in all their glory. No, but I love seeing things like that because it just shows... <laughs> You know, just the whole process of making it and just like, oh, he, he, like there's the team that's making this magic come to life. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really cool. it, it, and it's not even out of like laziness either. It's like, no, they're having a fight scene and there's just, just a fucking mirror in yeah, the yeah. scene. I, I, I prefer it being kept in because yeah. you know, it's just always those, you know, fun little Easter eggs. They can just like, hey, check that out. So yeah. slide whistle. Okay, yeah, that was, like, that was actually going to be the next thing I was going to talk about okay. was um, the, the big stunt in the movie being the, uh, the, the car flip. Which is the big stunt of the movie. Um, tell me they got it in one take. They got it in one take. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, so, okay. So the Wait, story, did they? No, 100% Damn. they did. Oh, they did. Okay. Yeah, wow. no, I'm not bullshitting you. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the car flip was um, 
uh, designed uh, for um, uh, as the intellectual property of W.J. Milligan, who at the time was the president of the American Thrill Show. Uh, they were like the, the, the time they were the big car show where they did, you know, car stunts and demolition derbies. Like they were the premier car entertainment circus, essentially. And um, uh, the stunt was theoretically proven possible through a computer simulation. It was at the time mm. a state of the art computer program where they were to simulate the physics and prove theoretically that um, the stunt was possible. Uh, it then became the uh, intellectual property of W.J. Milligan, who performed it for the first time in his car show. Uh, it was after that that he was approached by the producers, and they bought the uh, rights to the stunt. Hmm. So to, uh, to have it be used in the film and to prevent like anyone else from ever using that stunt for like a number of years. Milligan himself uh, is the one who... Uh, oversaw uh, the, uh, the stunt actually being performed on set. It took uh, months of preparations, uh, getting, you know, especially designing the car and the ram to, for it can be just absolutely perfect. And even on the day of filming, they had emergency divers, ambulances, cranes, just tons of extra safety precautions for God knows if anything goes wrong. Uh, stunt driver got in the car. There were no rehearsals. They just went for it. First try, first take, perfect flip. Uh, Why the slide whistle? Oh yeah, you yeah. Then, I was so they, I was so captured by the story, and then oh yeah, the and then they slide. add a slide whistle on top of it, um, <laughs> as if it wasn't it just wasn't impressive enough without the slide whistle. Uh, uh, Guy Hamilton has gone on record um, <laughs> that uh, admitting that. Uh, he very much regrets adding the slide whistle sound effect. <laughs> so uh, you have different cuts where you remove the crew in the mirror, but you're not going to remove the fucking slide whistle? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, does anybody have anything uh, meaningful to say about everyone's favorite casually re uh, racist redneck cop? <laughs> God well, cause, damn, I love J.W. Pepper. <laughs> Because, like, when, when Bond gets in a boat and he starts driving off, I'm like, all right, back to Louisiana we go. And then he shows up. I'm like, oh, hey. <laughs> he's a little bit more tolerable in this film. I really he's, like the scene of when he's just sticking his head out of the car and everyone's like, the hell is going on? He's definitely he's definitely funnier in this film. Uh, they definitely really ramped up uh, the, the comedy for the character. You know, because he was... He was already a fan favorite from Live and Let Die, so you know that you know they're gonna bring him back for another film. They're gonna turn him up to eleven, and boy, did they! Uh, I find myself quoting J.W. Pepper all the freaking time, just like get your cotton picking schnoz out of my pants, you know? Boy, he yep. is ugly. <laughs> Every chance I get, is his deliveries are just perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I I I I just I I just love him in, in both movies. I it, it's just the out there that I just really like. It was just like like yeah, I'm watching this. This exists. I've been deputized. <laughs> deputized. Um, anything cool or interesting about the jet car? Uh, the jet car. Um. Uh, was a model. <laughs> there mm. there uh, was entirely a model, or was no, there I mean, like no, a there scale? Was, there was, uh, there was a um, a car. You no, know, they just grafted wings onto an actual oh. car and just had that, you know, film that going down by the runway, and then the actual takeoff. That's a model. What's okay. the matter, Chaz? You never seen a plane before? <laughs> well, I, I figured that uh, they're not going to take a uh, jet engine and slap it onto a car and try to get it to be aerodynamically no, that, uh, functional. That that did not work. No, they just put uh, the wings onto a car and film that and then the actual thing flying in the air was a model. Yeah, try, trying to get a functional version of that would just basically be a really expensive way to get an engineer to say no. I know, uh, I know uh, bl blowing up the island was a combination of uh, practical <laughs> explosives on the set and model work. Yeah, during the movie, Chaz asked me, like, why do I feel like they actually blew up that island? I'm like, I'm pretty sure it'd be like a crime against nature if anyone blew up those islands in China and Thailand that look freaking incredible. Uh, well, I mean, just the opposite, in fact. Um, after the Man of the Golden Gun released, uh, that particular island uh, used for Scaramanga's Island became like a super popular tour spot. Like the, hmm. the island officially renamed itself James Bond Island. 
and it became just like just this Trademark. giant tourist destination for Bond fans to to go to. Hmm. And well, they so are they, they 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 turned that island into a resort, and they. Uh, they they kept the mushroom shaped rock and you know all of that. So. Is, is is it still around? The island. Well, I, I'm the resort. I, I, the resort. <laughs> no, it got beaten up by Godzilla in 1978. No, Shang Tsung turned it into his castle in Mortal Kombat. <laughs> Duh. Yeah, one of those ju- one of those Yunkers was Shang Tsung's Willie. I bet you didn't know that, huh? One of those what? The Yunkers, the, 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 the type of boat they were using. Oh, I don't know. That's any of them. Yeah, that's the name of that Chinese boat. It's got a flat bottom with the kind of wing-like sails. I'm pretty sure it's also the one that they used at the beginning of Mortal Kombat. Yeah, they had a type like that. Yeah. I like Mortal Kombat. Speaking of awesome boats, I would love to have a secret base and a derelict ship that's just yeah. in the water and everything is tilted to the side. I, but I, it's I, like I, retrofitted, so it's like flat on the ground kind of. Yeah. It's, always, it's always so trippy. I love the scenes in the, in the Queen Elizabeth. I it's want more so of that. trippy. I know the um, the bottoms up was also a real bar in uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, I still don't get the joke. Bottoms up because the y- oh, you that. toast and but they're also they have their asses in the air. Mm, still don't get it because the bartenders are basically like like less like a, like a third of a like a th- they're like a third of a foot below the bartending surface. So like most of the time they're on their knees and their asses are like par- like in parallel air, to the floor. Your ass is literally in your face. And, mm, still like, don't get it. Because it's a pun on, you know, bottoms up the toast. Mm-hmm. It has to do with this little <laughs> this little note you have right here. V A G. It's a little like that. <laughs> I, I I it's over my head. I don't get it. That's the point. You don't go to, you don't go to a restaurant like that for the drinks, you go there for the service. <laughs> yeah, but then it's I mean I can't walk out of here without getting shot. <laughs> well, that depends, Cruz. Have you invented solar power? Oh, no. <laughs> well, you might be okay then, because it... if I did, I wouldn't use it to just blow up a plane <laughs> for no reason. Uh, for no reason. For no re- he didn't do it for no reason. He did it to prove a point. What was his point? That he could put, that he'd harness the power of the sun to blow up a plane. Incredible, just which, like, like Sunny D. Which like back, <laughs> which like back then, Scaring considering how uh, like even now, well, like people, especially from that era, are like incredulous when it comes to solar power. So I, I suppose this was kind of like their way of being like, oh, look at you could destroy an entire <laughs> boat with it like this. Anyone comments or questions about the man with the golden gun? No questions, but it's like. I'm assuming Nick Knack just dies from exposure up there. <laughs> you can believe whatever you want. Okay. I'm so guessing he doesn't come back. No. Okay, so he yeah. dies from exposure. Yeah, so you're, you're free to believe whatever you want. Whatever he was massacred. Happened. I think they just forget about him. Yeah. Just leave him up just there. Just left yeah. him up there. Just, just, uh, <laughs> so, so, like, someone goes to inspect this uh, abandoned derelict uh, uh, junk, and up, up in the crow's nest, there's just this very tiny skeleton trapped in a wicker Wait, cage. How, yes, how thank that? you. I think I'll have the white one. Oh my god, I forgot about Nick Knack. <laughs> Let's see, it's been two weeks. Yeah, he's dead. Uh, producer Harry Saltzman, who, uh, like I said, this this is actually going to be the last film that he is, uh, is going to be attached to. Uh, for some reason, he was completely obsessed with the idea of this movie having an elephant stampede sequence. He was so obsessed that he actually ordered and had custom made uh, 2,600 pairs of elephant shoes uh, to be used in the sequence. Did not tell anyone he was doing this. He did not inform Guy Hamilton. He did not inform uh, writer Richard Maybaum. He did not inform Cubby Broccoli. He just did it. Did he just turn into Cersei Lannister? (laughs) Well, one day... Someone had a fetish. So one day, as they're, as they're filming, and I believe they were probably still, they probably would have still been in, like, the, the, the Thailand location, um, here arrives this crate filled with 2,600 pairs of elephant shoes. (laughs) (laughs) And everyone's just like... And no elephants. (laughs) Yeah, with no elephants. (laughs) (laughs) Like, what the, what the hell is this? So that's, and that's Harry Saltzman for you. Wait, it's addressed to Harry Saltzman. What the fuck is this? (laughs) Harry! Harry, you got some splaining to do. <laughs> Harry, we already fil- we already finished filming here. We're going to Scaramanga's Island. What do you mean you buy elephant shoes in bulk? <laughs> Is it volume or weight? <laughs> volume discount? We didn't need them to begin with. 
Uh, excuse me, Mr. Broccoli, I had to go try to cancel an order of 26,000 elephant shoes. Harry, you said try to. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm worried about it. <laughs> I like to imagine every single movie, just a, bo- a crate full of dead crabs just arrives at the studio without fail. No one knows where they're coming from. Just every movie, there's more crabs. No, 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 Broccoli, it's okay this time. I got the crab shoes. <laughs> Would someone please get Jared Leto off the set? We can't take any more of this stupid mail. <laughs> Is it because it derives damaged? Oh. <laughs> I don't get it. No one can catch him. No hitman can match him. For his million dollar skill. One golden shot. God damn it. <laughs> James Bond school bus. <laughs> Breaks oh. your arm in two. Get on the James Bond oh. school bus. Godzuki and Frankenstein. <laughs> and Frankenstein. Mr. Barbera, you need to stop. <laughs> Not everything can be a cartoon spinoff. Frankenstein Jr. chases scum. Around the world. <laughs> Around the, world. <laughs> the adventures of Godzilla and Frankenstein and James Bond Jr. <laughs> we interrupt this advertisement to blow your mind. Yeah, we were looking at some of the outtakes from like years ago and we see you like walking around in Walmart and I'm like, look at this kid. Look at this little kid here. <laughs> yeah. Willie, this like, little boy. Uh, like, like, I see you, I see you with like pictures of you from back then. It's like, Willie, you look like an improvised weapon. <laughs> What does that even mean? Like you could pick him up and hit him with? Yeah, <laughs> like hit people with him. He's like, he's like, like come here. <laughs> I was also that kid in school where like, you know, the discussion came up and then, you know, at some point someone says, yeah, never trust the quiet kid. Yeah. And then all the heads in the room turn towards me. Right. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> we had, we had a assembly where, uh, Everyone looked at you like that? No, well, they had this discussion of, like, be nice to quiet kids because, you know... <laughs> because, A, you know, they might... Sometimes they lead to suicide because they're so lonely, or they might go fucking crazy. So, as soon as we go back to the classroom, this girl who never fucking talked to me started talking to me and be How like... suspicious. Hmm. And I felt so, awesome. so condescended, too. I'm like, mm. just... Snickers and shut the fuck up. <laughs> hey, thanks for the candy. Are we good? Yep. Okay. I'm ready to talk mm-hmm. about our LSD trip last night. Yep. Oh, God. And then we can talk about the movie. After the commercial success of Destroy All Monsters, they obviously stopped making Godzilla movies, right? Haha, <laughs> wrong! Godzilla's 15th birthday in 1969, and the competing kid-friendly kaiju Gamera, inspired Tomoyuki Tanaka to make another installment in the de-evolving franchise. Godzilla's new appeal to children came at the right time, however, as Japan's economy was becoming a two-income family setup, leading to many Japanese children living the latchkey life. Despite original director Ishiro Honda's unhappiness with what Toho had done to his walking nuclear metaphor, he returned to direct Godzilla's Revenge to provide his perspective on the breakup of the nuclear family as seen through the eyes of a child. This is illustrated through depressing shots of towering industrial smokestacks, child endangerment, and abandoned warehouses. 
Despite this message being easier to catch upon second viewings, the film has instead become infamous as the worst Godzilla film ever made, due to its overwhelming use of stock footage, bizarre story, and the addition of a talking minya who sounds suspiciously like Barney Rubble. So, what did you guys think of Car for Cell? Very cheap, very good. Barney uh, Rubble? I was thinking more just Barney the Dinosaur. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Minda with the voice is now the keeper of my nightmares. <laughs> yeah. As if he wasn't already. No, not even not even Minya with the voice. Godzilla says you have to fight your own battles, Chaz. You have to fight your own battles, Chaz. Don't be a coward. <laughs> Don't hey, be a b- 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 bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I, t- I tried really hard to find the voice actor for him. I couldn't find shit. Really? Yeah, I was really I mean, disappointed. Are you, are you really surprised? Would you want your name? Attached? Yeah, uh, like, are, you, are you sure he wanted to be found next uh, to this movie? I'm pretty, he's probably still in hiding to this day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the Zodiac Killer then. Got it. <laughs> that makes so much sense because the whole movie, we started devolving into like Minya being a war criminal. <laughs> like, Take my, no my... prisoners, Ichiro. <laughs> Show no mercy. The carotid artery will let them bleed out if you cut it. Did I ever tell you my favorite movie is Predator? I mean, my 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 first line when uh, Minda shows up on screen <laughs> waving his arm is, Hey, I have free candy in my van over here. <laughs> I'm just picturing Minya holding a machete and slicing it across his chest. <laughs> yeah. I learned this from the Apaches. Sorry, I wasn't laughing at what you were you were saying, but I was just imagine Minya just somehow gets a hold of a nuclear device <laughs> and he's just laughing like <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a dud. Well, it would certainly be better than the other Predator movies we've gotten recently. <laughs> <laughs> Alien versus Midna. <laughs> Whoever wins, Midna. we lose. <laughs> Did, did you just say Minna? Yeah, it's Minya. Minya, okay. Minya. Or as Ichiro says it, Minya-san. Minya-san? Minya's a monster. <laughs> Smart kid. No what? Kid. <laughs> no kid. No one's ever going to make me a son. Oh. Hey, yeah. kid. That, that guy holding you hostage? That's not a knife. This, this is, is a knife. knife. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a five-second head start. <laughs> Man is the most dangerous game, except Until for me, he met of me. <laughs> <laughs> when Rambo won a wall, they sent me after him. <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to help? Are you sure you don't want to help me gut Gabara? <laughs> oh, the colors! When I killed your brother, I sounded just <laughs> like this. <laughs> just <laughs> like this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Minya's kind of the highlight of this film, but uh, <laughs> apart from that, you guys surprisingly had no problem rewatching all the stock footage. It was jarring at first, but it honestly didn't bother me that much. Hmm. Like, it was pretty brief, so it was hard to be annoyed yeah. by it. Yeah, it was, you guys were kind of reacting as if it were, like, the best of Godzilla. One thing I do have to give this film credit for and um, uh, for both uh, the reused footage and the new footage, the monster fight choreography in this movie is actually really good. I, in, in terms of just kind of the monster fights alone, I, this one's actually honestly pretty high up there for me, both like kind of the highlight fights with the, with the Kamakuras and Ibera, as well as, uh, you know, the, the sh movement they had against uh, what was it, Gabora. 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 Mm-hmm. I mean, honestly, like, the monster fights in this were a blast. I, was, I, I really loved them. Mm. Yeah, that move that Godzilla does where he just swings him over his head by his arm is pretty sweet. It was, yeah, it was freaking badass. Yeah. It's like, and he, like, spins like a top in midair yeah. just like that way and lands <laughs> on his head. <laughs> so, Willie, how did, you, uh, how did you like your kaiju iteration? Huh? How'd you like your kaiju iteration? It's gonna look like you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah, it did. Which one? In the last episode, I said that Willie kind of gets his own kaiju in this movie. I see and that's it. That's Gabara. I see it. Oh my god. <laughs> my, <laughs> I'm sorry. It cracks me up because my first bit. Bye. My first. Gabara, come back. <laughs> Gabara, where are you going? I find that funny because. Don't be a coward. You have to fight your own battles. <laughs> 
I mean, I think he's a pretty cool. I think he's like a cool looking monster overall, but he he does have a tinge of goofiness to him. No, but I think yeah, he's kinda... I think that's on purpose though, because mm. I no, think that, that I think that's part of the internalizing escapism thing is that yes, you're imagining that all of your problems in life are in the form of this giant unbeatable kaiju, but still a part of you wants to kind of demoralize and reduce the perceived threat of that menace. So it makes sense that that the creature that you create in your mind does appear kind of goofy. Mm-hmm. And you know, he is he was kind of his goofiness was in itself kind of threatening in a sort of off-putting kind of way, you know, mm. sort of that, you know, the monsters that you dream up and you imagine as a kid usually sort of have s- these exaggerated, grotesque, almost like cartoony clown-like features that kind of enters that uncanniness. And I think Gabra, I, I think his design really emphasized that, especially especially in his roar, like that distinct kind of like kind of high-pitched, trilling kind of, Roar! It was very off-putting. Yeah, he's kind of a mix between a cat and a toad, <laughs> so that's kind of like the idea. So one of the only uh, times that Gabra's ever come back in any part of the universe is uh, the Godzilla anime series has a prequel novel to the events of the series, where pretty much every single monster is rampaging the Earth, including Gabra. So what happens in the book is that Gabra appears in the Amazon around 2012. A Japanese Brazilian boy named Ichido wanders into the area, meets a girl named Mira, and aids her in defeating Gabara. Mira shoots it in the eye with an arrow laced with thermite. The, oh. <laughs> the explosion causes Gabara to emit electricity and fall down into a river where carnivorous fish and alligators eat him. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty fucking metal. To which Ichido likens to a bully being retaliated against. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know... <laughs> So it's a nice little nod to Godzilla's Revenge in the prequel novel. But to his credit, I actually like Gabra. He's kind of regarded as the worst monster in the series. I like Gabra because of how fucking weird he is. I like yeah. like do, is there anything else that comes up with him? No. Aww. I mean I mean Did, stretch, stretch. he never comes back. I mean in a way that works though yeah. because he's not real mm-hmm. all the monster stuff in this movie takes place within the mind of this child and like i i, I kind of after the showing i kind of surprised Cruz a little bit because i kind of i really enjoy the premise behind this movie as, as i uh, said last night if you were to do a child's godzilla if you were to make a godzilla movie for, you know, a child aiming at that demographic, that's the way to do it. I really love the entire idea of this, you know, poor kid in this crappy situation, being a latchkey kid, uh, kind of his only real close friend being this, you know, completely bland vanilla ice cream (laughs) girl and this, you know, old toy maker constantly being uh, hounded on by these bullies and internalizing that with these fantasies and, you know, using the fantasies uh, going to these monsters to find his own inner strength. And I honestly thought it was kind of beautiful in a way. I liked the kid. I didn't find him, you know, (laughs) annoying or anything. I, I honestly, you know, felt rather attached to this kid and his troubles and his plights. You know, I, I was, you know, Looking forward to you know, seeing things turn out okay for him, and I had fun watching this movie. The biggest thing that bugged me the most was the end where they were friends with the <laughs> yeah, bullies. question mark. That was kind of weird. Like, like he just like pulls this ho- completely horrible prank on this innocent <laughs> bystander, and like you know all the bullies rattle around him, and the film was kind of making it seem like we're supposed to be cheering that on, yeah. like that was somehow a good thing that he just completely did this horrible thing to this guy who didn't deserve it. Why are we happy? Yeah, that it was weird. Yeah, you but, guys you guys had the best reaction to that, which was like, you're cheering for each hero for standing up to himself, and then he fucks with this painter, and you guys are like, wait, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> yeah. What is going on? That, that aside, though, um, yeah, the premise and the, and the message of, of this movie, 
Um, I will flat out say I do not agree that this is the worst Godzilla film. Thank you. I agree. Of, the, you. of the ones that we've seen, it is not the worst. Yeah. No. It is, I, I, can, I totally see where people are coming from when they say that. I think it's because they're looking for what this movie, what they want it to be, yeah. as opposed to what it is. Like, yeah, it's a kid's film and it's very lighthearted, but it really didn't shy away from... You know, the things I was really trying to bring attention to the kid just, you know, home invasion and the kid getting kidnapped and being and being, you know, held at knife point. That's pretty freaking intense for mm-hmm. a kid. I felt that this is being made by people who want to tell this story and want to tell it as good as they can with the limited budge that they've been given. And in my opinion, I think they accomplished that. The majority of the f- of the film that's not in the fantasy You're in the kid's home, devoid of parents, very alone, very isolated. And then everything outside of that Mm. is desolate. That construction site place where they're not allowed to play. This extremely dangerous abandoned warehouse. You see out in the distance several like factories and smokestacks. These kids are walking along uh, industrial purpose uh, train tracks. <laughs> this entire film is just completely oozing with this like lower class ghetto style <laughs> neighborhood. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of depressing. In it a way. is yeah. kind of depressing. Yeah. You know, that's, that's why I say like you know this is a world that has some very serious social issues, and here's how this poor child copes with that. Yeah, I'm really glad that you're you've been able to pick up on all that because. Because, like I said, with Ashira Hana coming back, like the original director of the, you know, standing the test of time Godzilla classic comes to direct this film, and he still finds a way to implement his views on social issues with it. Uh, in addition to kind of taking inspiration from uh, Yosujiro Ozu's film I Lived But, and it has a lot of parallels between the two. So it was very much him trying to make his own version of that while still kind of working Godzilla into it and kind of like you said, captures just the overall look of what Japan was kind of turning into, especially with the the lower class version of it. So my history with this film, as weird as it is, is that my grandparents who helped get me into the Godzilla series kind of always kept an eye out for whenever it would air on TV. So one day they handed me a tape that came in its own cover that they had and they in Sharpie wrote, Godzilla's Revenge, and then on the back they wrote Godzilla and Ichiro, and then some other description on it, and I'm like, I have, is this a legit film, or is this like something that you guys made up, because this looks really odd, Mm -hmm. and it was just half of the film recorded off of TNT's Monster Vision when it still existed, complete with a bunch of weird, strange commercials, and an episode of our gang from the little rascals and an episode of ultra seven, which was connected to the Ultraman series from Japan. And then I'm watching a film that doesn't take place really in the Godzilla universe. It takes place in reality about a kid who's obsessed with Godzilla films and it's coming off of a TV broadcast. And is for me, it was just one of the weirdest Godzilla experiences I've ever seen. Cause it's like, what the hell is going on? That's Godzilla's revenge. Yeah, pretty much. Like I, I saw it the best way I could have, which is warped, strange, with no context. <laughs> the entire movie. Yeah. Uh, the the only thing you were missing was uh, being uh, three quarters asleep. Yeah. Well, that kind of works its way into it too, because when you watch this over and over, it kind of works its way into your dreams and your subconscious. <laughs> and then for the longest time, as an archivist, I tried to hold on to everything, and I couldn't find that tape for years. So I was convinced that it was just gone until I went through every single VHS tape I had, and then one day I find it, and I just start crying, because I thought it was gone forever. But apart from that connection, like, you say that this was targeted for kids. As a kid, I did not like Ichiro whatsoever. I did Uh not connect to him, because the last thing that I wanted to see as a kid obsessed with Godzilla is another kid (laughs) obsessed with Godzilla (laughs) who's given me a bad name with his short shorts and his yellow hat (laughs) and his blue jacket. Like, I do not think I would have been friends with Ichiro if I ever met up with him. You'd have been one of the bullies. Uh, No, I wouldn't have been one of the bullies because, I mean, as a kid, I was very much the... Because you know how in this film he's constantly bringing up Godzilla, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's something that I I would also do to the point where 
there was one time where, as a kid, I was in the back of a cop car, and I asked the cop, hey, do you watch Godzilla movies? Because uh, <laughs> what else am I going to do? But as an adult who now has a better understanding of what I went through as a kid in terms of abandonment and endangerment, I kind of have a stronger connection to it now because I can kind of relate to it. But instead of a toy maker, I had my grandparents to watch over me, and I also had to rely on Godzilla movies to escape that reality. So there's a stronger connection to it now. You know, there is that kind of almost nostalgic connection with escaping into your own fantasies as a kid when things aren't going your way. And I I feel like the most beautiful thing about this movie is the idea of this kaiju obsessed kid transforming all of his traumas and his fears and his worries and all this bad stuff, internalizing it as a kaiju in his mind that needs to be defeated. And the kaiju shares the name of his bully. And so I just, you know, just looking at that, at that lens of this as a child's fantasy of, you know, all these problems that are surrounding you and that you don't know how to deal with, they might as well be a giant hulking monster you're unable to defeat. And I think one of the, one of the lines of dialogue that perfectly sums up the message of this movie is when the toy maker says, let's go home. And a just says, there's no one there. So I mentioned how I originally saw this film on a recorded VHS tape mm-hmm. I did my best to kind of take out the best segments from that tape that kind of made it what it was, and I put it on here to show you guys. We will return to Godzilla's Revenge in a moment on BNB Monster Vision. One banana or two bananas? Uh, One female orangutan or two female orangutans? uh, One pizza or two pizzas? uh, he seems to prefer two. Order the legend. Get any two medium or two large pizzas with two toppings. Carry out or delivered for one low price. Pizza, pizza. The desert is full of wildlife, but have you ever seen a blue coyote? There's a blue coyote in Palm Springs and now in Palm Desert. Cool off with the wildlife at the Blue Coyote Grill. We'll keep the wild coyote margarita on ice till you get here. At the Blue Coyote Grill, our authentic southwestern cuisine will have your taste buds going wild. It just might be hard to decide which taste treat to indulge in. The desert may be full of wildlife, but there's nothing quite like the Blue Coyote Grill. Nothing can prepare you for the outer limits and the new Twilight Zone. Back to back every weekday on TNT. Big punch, big punch. What the fuck was that? Big punch, big punch. Big punch. Whoa, milk. Let's make the most of it with Nestle Quick. <laughs> TBS Destination Sunday. This Sunday. This commercial honestly scared me every time I watched it, though. It shot down the sky until it disappeared. Water, who is out there searching for UFOs? Sunday, 9 Eastern, only on TBS Destination Sunday. Hey! Oh, that guy? Why did he look where he was going? Why didn't you got your hand? I like to drive that way. It's a menace to protect. To protect the guys that walk. Can't even tell what that says. Ultra Seven. <laughs> yeah. I'd be down for Ultra Man. Looking for something? Yes, sir. The alien in car number one. Car number one is an unidentified type of tourist, sir. Right? <laughs> and you left your car unguarded? <laughs> Go after them. Yes, sir. Nuns called. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time I was like, is this still Godzilla? What the fuck is going Carl, on? Okay, but... Wait, Soka, someone's behind that tree. <laughs> <laughs>
I can't go on. You knew when you chose me for this about my fear of explosions, Commander. I can't take it anymore. Chemicals, mines, guns, what next? And I was like, is this Godzilla still? No, this is better. <laughs> it's Gun Tankzilla. Yep. This is honestly my favorite. I remember this. Really? Yeah. Holy shit. I remember this promo, yeah. 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 That's my childhood. <laughs> Honestly, that the feels blue like, coyote. That's your childhood. <laughs> Honestly, it kind of feels like that's how like you got some of your inspiration for how you do music videos. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, so that's that's an interesting uh, introduction to this film, combining it with a cocktail of our gang and Ultra Seven, and I didn't know what the fuck that was. What was okay? The only the, the only one thing that that really really confused you was that like black and white one with the kids and no one. <laughs> What was that? Yeah, uh, did you, have you ever, well, I mean, you've seen Little Rascals, right? I, maybe? I know, like, I, I don't, I think I saw it when I was, like, really young. I really don't have much memory of it. I mean, I wasn't expecting to see Officer Pepper as a Little Rascal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have any of you guys seen, like, like the 90s Little Rascals? The... No. Double really? Willie, have you mo- seen Little Rascals? Cruz, was like, it a cartoon? I, I feel like I remember a movie. Yeah. The only, the only thing about the only memory of Little Rascals that I have maintained in my brain space is just the alfalfa hair thing. Yeah. That's like literally it. Yeah. It was based off of Our Gang, which was a, a series of short films from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And that's what was showing during that thing. So it's like that's the original version of that hmm. particular nice. uh, kids or whatever. Interesting and weird. Yeah, very the, weird. The one that Mo was in before he became ugly. I hope I'll be able to show some of a. Uh, I hope I'll be able to include some of the uh, stuff I just showed you guys because because those like promos and especially the the Warner Brothers ones are like owned by Turner Company. Every single time I try to upload it to Studio Lost and Found, it gets immediately copyright striked. So we'll see. Is this toy inventor Manami? Ah, how are you today? He's just sleeping at your place. He's all right. <laughs> My response was, how do you know that? Because <laughs> I watch him day and night. <laughs> and I was like, if there's a people, he you know, gets into his room. Well, one It's of just big- like Silent Hill 4. We now come to our list of alternate titles. Yay! Which is surprisingly Ooh. short. <laughs> which is surprisingly short because Godzilla's Revenge pretty much just takes the cake. So the literal Japanese title reads as Godzilla, Minya, Gabara, All Monsters Attack. In Germany, Godzilla, Attack All Monsters. In Spain, The Island of the Monsters. In Brazil, Monsterland. And in America, we have Godzilla's Revenge, which originated from the fact that distributors in America wanted to release the film as Minya, Son of Godzilla, forgetting the fact that Son of Godzilla was already a thing, so they instead opted for Godzilla's Revenge, which makes even less sense. 
eat each other's revenge against the innocent sign painter. Mm-hmm. Soon all the vacuum tubes will be mine and mine alone. Ichiro's Revenge or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jake, would you recommend The Man with the Golden Gun or Godzilla's Revenge to a first-time viewer? Man with the Golden Gun? Yes, I would recommend it. It is pretty much general fare that you're going to get in the Roger Moore era. These kind of stand alone, as Cruz put them, uh adventure of the week comic strip style uh bond adventures all the roger moore films are generally really easy to get into and any of them can really serve as a stepping on point i personally think man with a golden gun is pretty strong and i think it's a it'd be a good first one to watch as for godzilla's revenge despite the fact that i have been singing its praises all podcast for a first time viewer i'm going to recommend it as probably not uh a really great stepping on point um, for multiple reasons. The fact that all the Godzilla stuff takes uh, takes place in a fantasy. Um, it being, you know, really focused on this uh, on this kid and his personal problems. I'm gonna. It's it's not gonna be for everyone. I have to agree completely with uh, Jake on both on both points. Uh, the Roger Moore era being a mission of the week is a very apropos uh, description of his tenure as as the Doctor. I mean, as James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> you can't really go wrong with with that. Godzilla's Revenge is very much not something that portrays the series. It it's definitely has a lot of the same kind of not really lightheartedness is the wrong word, but but it, it has a lot of the same factors that makes it different from the first film. How how I was always saying this isn't what I feel like the first film made the series out to be and then I realized that the series is changing from that. But this film definitely is just a little bit rough for a starting point. Yeah, I'm going to largely agree with Jacob on this one. Um, although I will say, if you want to uh, have your impression of the Godzilla series be some sort of almost David Lynchian kind of <laughs> thriller, then uh, yeah, go ahead, watch this one with an open mind if you're, uh, if you're really that kind of weird. Um, yeah, Roger Moore brings on his... Uh, his kind of characteristic heroism in this uh, in man with the golden gun. So it's, it's a, it's kind of a clear conscience view. You feel good watching it all the way through with him. Unfortunately, I can't recommend man with the golden gun, mostly because there are just so many more entries in the series that I think are a better entry point. And this is just, like I said, more kind of run of the mill episode of the week kind of shtick. Uh, and then same for Godzilla's revenge. It really needs a lot more context and a better introduction in order to appreciate it and understand it. First time introduction, definitely not one for me. Next time on James Bond, it's Spy versus Spy in what I consider to be Roger Moore's best film. We'll sink in our metal teeth when James Bond returns in The Spy Who Loved Me. And next time on Godzilla, we face an inconvenient truth as our favorite kaiju fights a living, breathing political message. Break out the tie-dye and save the Earth for Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster. Thank you all for listening to Bond vs. Godzilla. We'll see you next time with a martini in one hand and a rubber suit in the other. Stay tuned and stay watching!